Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And this is our 100th episode. Isn't this amazing? You know, I can still remember back after we released the very first episode saying to Andrew, are we really going to produce an episode every two weeks? How on earth are we going to manage it? <laughs> and I can't remember what his response was, but I can remember thinking, okay, we'll just think about doing one episode at a time. We'll just think about the episode that's right in front of us. And back then, the idea of producing 20 episodes seemed like a huge amount of work. And now, unbelievably, we're at number 100. Yeah. <laughs> that's so special. So we're going to have a glass of champagne to celebrate. And I hope that you'll join us with a, a glass of your choice and just drink and toast to 100 episodes of Fruity Knitting. Yeah, Yay. cheers. <laughs> I can't drink too much of this or else we won't get this episode really? done. <laughs> I can tell immediately. So this episode is all about looking back reviewing and celebrating and enjoying the last four years because during this time our own lives have changed so much and it's been a lot of fun actually to go back and review and think about who we've met during this time and who we've had on the show and also the places that we've seen and filmed for the show. So I asked Andrew to go back through all of our records and just come up with a list of numbers for who's been on the show. Yeah okay so I've broken things down a bit. I've got I have 114 feature interviews. So it's actually more than one per episode. Sometimes yeah. we have two in one way or another. Uh, Knitters of the World, 65 guests on Knitters of the World. 32 designers have presented their latest designs on new releases. Then we have 13 shepherdesses talking about the yarn that they produce from their own flock in Meet the Shepherdess. And then we've got our makers segment, which is the smallest, newest segment that we have. We've had three guests on that. That's where we have somebody from some other craft. An talk artisan about. crafts person. Yeah. yeah. So not related to knitting, but they talk about, we do a sort of mini feature on them. And there we've had a shoemaker. We've had a kilt, kilt, maker. kilt maker in Edinburgh. That was cool. And we've had a teddy bear maker. Yeah. So that was really but, uh, great. Yeah. So in total, how many guests? It's, so that's about 227 guests there. 227 guests. Yep. Well, here's cheers to our guests. <laughs> that's a lot of guests. That's a lot of guests. And I also looked at it from a technical perspective. So just quickly, in case this is dry, I looked at episode 99. And what I found there is we had just in terms of source files, so video files and images and audio tracks that we've got, we used around 170 files. We actually got a lot more than that, but we used about 170 and that came to about 80 gigabytes of storage. Which is less than what we would normally have the on average, average. Yeah. So the average once we've created everything is 140 gigabytes per episode. Per episode. Just in space that we've used. Okay. So, so. for a hundred episodes, how many gigabytes? Well, I think that's 14 terabytes, unless I'm getting <gasps> that wrong. That's extraordinary. It's a lot of space. So we now just have a really good archive of mini documentaries on knitting and spinning and wool, actually covering most of the big names, the great names in the industry. So I'm really yep. happy and proud about that. I think that's great. Yep. And when I was preparing and filming and editing all the segments, and in particular with the interviews, my aim was always to make the material stand up to being watched a few times so that it's got enough informative content that people would really benefit from watching it a couple of times. So to celebrate episode 100, I've put together a compilation of highlights from a variety of different interviews. So the highlights are only about two or three minutes each. And when I was doing this, I was really struck by the variety of guests and topics that we've actually had on the show. Mm. So these highlights aren't necessarily from my favourite interviews, but actually when you're working really hard together with a, a, a guest and, you, and you're putting your best effort in, they all become special to you. They're all your favourites in a way. Yeah. But it's just a good mix, I think. And I think you'll really enjoy it, even if you've seen all of the interviews before, because Nobody has seen our footage as much as I have, believe me, because I've prepared it all beforehand and then I've been there filming it and helping the guest and then afterwards I edit it, which means, and when you edit, you get to know every single word because you're deciding, am I going to keep that bit or am I going to leave that little bit out and I'm going to tidy it up here so you know every word. And then when it's finished, I watch it a couple of times to check for mistakes so I know our footage inside out. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> after I put the compilation together, 
I really enjoyed it, so I think you will too. Yeah, that's a good thing. (laughs) In Knitters of the World, we're featuring a guest from Berlin who has created something very special just to celebrate our 100th episode. He contacted us and told us he was going to send us something. We didn't know what it was going to be, but it arrived about two weeks ago, and we were so impressed that we've persuaded him to come on to Knitters of the World and tell us all about it. So that's going to be heaps of fun. We've also got a quick question and answer session on fruity knitting and our history. Our daughter Madeline is still here, so she's going to pop in and say hi. And of course, Andrea and I are going to be giving giving you updates on our own projects. So we're up to bring and brag because the sky is finished. The sky is finished. (laughs) The sky is falling in. Okay, this is by Marie Wallen. It's from her North Sea collection. And the yarn I used was the Hampshire Four Ply from the Grey Sheep Company. So last episode, I told you that I've knitted 25 sweaters. Well, this is number 26. And out of those 26 sweaters, four of them are yoke sweaters. I think there's about two or three that are raglan sleeve and the rest are set in sleeve because set in sleeve is really by far my favorite shaping, my favorite construction because it fits the body so well. And I really like to wear my uh, sweaters fitted, so with very little ease. And when you wear your, your sweaters fitted, it is so much more easy to see, so much more easy. So much easier, you could say. <laughs> it's easier to see whether the, the sweater is actually fitting you well or not. And in my experience, that's particularly the case for yoke sweaters. So it's easier to wear a, a yoke sweater that's oversized. You won't notice if it's fitting you or not fitting you. But if you want to wear one that's with little ease, you'll really tell if it's not fitting you. So out of the four yoke sweaters, I've got them here. This one I've done as well is by Marie Wallen. That was bottom up. And this one is by Jennifer Bill. That's also bottom up. And this one you'll all recognize. It's the Caitlin Hunter Zweig and that one was top down. So for each of these designs, I knitted them to be more fitted than what the designer intended. So I had to actually rework the yokes on all of them so that they would fit me well. So for this design here, Marie Wallen, she she's designed it with a little bit more ease than what I've done, and she hasn't put in any short row shaping for the neck. Now you can get away with no short row shaping if it's more oversized. Short row shaping normally just helps you raise the, the, the height of the back neck, so the back neck will be higher than the front neck, and it just fits you around the neck more naturally and and easily. You can get away without short rows if it's an oversized yoke sweater because then the neckline is kind of just wide and even like this and it can look really quite elegant because it's the same on, on the front and the back. But then the whole jumper has to be have more ease in it. So I definitely wanted to put short row shaping in this and I have. Normally what I would do if I'm going to put in short row shaping, I'd put it in below the yoke. So as soon as you've joined the sleeves to the body, I would start about here with the first short row and it would go across the left sleeve, around the back, across the right sleeve, and it would end about here. So that would be my first short row. And then I would go back again and end about three or four stitches shorter than the first short row. And I might put in about three sets of short row right down here. So I couldn't do it with this design for a couple of reasons. First of all, the body is in this quite complicated 30 row chart twister stitch patterning. And because it's knitted in the round, the charts are all for for knitting in the round round with the right side facing. So, and to do a short row, you have to start purling back. I didn't want to figure out the chart on how to do this this pattern on the purl row for a start. So that, that would have made it complicated. The second thing is, Marie's actually put in some really great raglan sleeve shaping here. So as soon as she's joined the sleeves to the body, she's put in some raglan shaping just under there. And that's a really great shaping thing to do because if you don't do it, sometimes you can get this extra sort of little bit of baggy material or flap of material across here. And the sh- and the raglan shaping there just shapes in nice and neatly around that natural curve that you've got in your body there. So that's particularly important if it's going to be a close fitting yoke. So I couldn't put in my short row shaping where I would normally do it, but I did sneak one in on the very last row of the, of the twisted stitch patterning. I probably started it about here and 
went around the back to about there. So I snuck one tiny one in there. The next place that you would normally think, okay, I'll put in short rows would be below this color work section. But optically, I didn't think that would look good because this whole body is, is it's quite a busy pattern. So the whole twisted stitch is really busy. And then straight after the twisted stitch patterning, you go into a color work patterning. So it's all busy and I think it's really well balanced. If I had put in about three inches of wide of just straight stocking stitch in, in the neutral color at the back, it just would optically wouldn't look good. It would just sort of look bare, you know, so I didn't, I didn't want to do that there, but I did actually, I snuck one in. <laughs> <laughs> I snuck That's one right. in again from about here around the back to there. So I've just put in two very sort of, um, uh, What's the word? Just like gently. Discreet. Uh, discreet. Two discreet short rows there. And the rest of my short rows were done up the top, up here. So on all of these yoke sweaters, I've had to just, I've, I haven't looked at the pattern and what, what their calculations have said. I've just tried it on and done it by how it fits on my body. So what you do is you go, you, you knit up to the final, it's hard for me to see here, but for the final row of color work, and then you try it on. And it's sort of this shape here. So then you, it's just a matter of looking at it and thinking, where are the gaps that I want to fill in? So I could see already that my pink, my color work was right up here, and I really didn't want to add any extra height at the front neck because you put in, I've got a, about a five row rib, which I put, you know, hem or collar that, that I put in at the end. So you've got a, you've got about a half a centimeter that you're going to add, but I knew that I didn't want to have any height here, but I did want to fill in about three centimeters on either side just to cover those gaps. So you try it on, you look at it and then you think, okay, I want three centimeters here, three centimeters there, nothing here. So I'd start, uh, it's hard for me to see. I'd start my first short row about here and then I knit right around the back to about there and then I go back again and end three stitches or so short of, of the previous short row and you just keep doing that ending a few stitches shorter every time until you've got that gap covered up and then you've got no extra um, material at the front but only at the sides. Now I did that and that's typically how you do it. Then I tried it on and I noticed that I still had a bit of extra material up here. It was kind of puckering a little bit. And I think that's because I'm kind of scrawny. Scrawny. <laughs> I am just across here. So I didn't need that material. And this is how you just customize it yourself. So I unripped it back to the color work again and just did a couple of short rows and saw, yes, it's lying flat. And then I thought, okay, I actually need to decrease earlier. So on this yoke, wherever you see those white gaps, and I can't see it here, so this is a decreased row, and that's a decreased row, and then you've got one final decreased row right before the neckband. So I realized that I actually needed to do some of my decreasing a little bit earlier, and I needed to do it here. So I did a couple of sets of short rows, and then I decreased a few stitches here and here to get rid of that lumpy bumpy bit, and, and then tried it on. Yes, it's still lying flat, did another couple of short rows and then you do your final one where you pick up all your wraps and turns. I actually do German short rows so I don't pick up wraps and turns. And then that's how you get it to lie flat. But that is really an individual fit. So for example, my daughter is pretty much the same size as me in the torso, but she's not as scrawny as me across the shoulders. She's just a bit wider here. So I tried the jumper on her and it looks like it's pulling her a little bit, but it fits me perfectly. So it's impossible for a designer to make a, a fitted yoke sweater that's going to suit every single body's shape yeah. perfectly. So this is something you can kind of do yourself and then you'll get a perfect fit. So I'll show you a little bit of footage and you should see that around the neck, it's really lying flat. So it's just a matter of trying it on every couple of short rows and just playing around thinking oh, I can lose a bit of material here. So I'll take a few stitches out and then that doesn't take a lot of time. And then you've got something that fits you really well. 
this is under construction. I will give you an update on my current project, but I did also think it's a chance to look back over the last four years of my knitting development because I did essentially start knitting when we started this show. So I looked at some of our earlier episodes and what I found was a lot of the things that we were talking about back then is still relevant to my knitting today. So I'm going to include a couple of short extracts from those early episodes as we go along here. I'm knitting the Celestial Design by Martin Story. It's a sweet spring summer top um, for Andrea. Of course, I'm knitting it in the Santness Duo yarn, which is a wool cotton blend, 50-50% of each. I showed you this completed back piece in the last episode and I whipped through this pretty quickly, although I haven't always been able to knit this fast. Way back in episode three, I was knitting on my first pair of socks and I mentioned that I was finding the progress quite slow. Andrea, of course, was beside me and she had very helpful advice for me. You can hear that here. <laughs> I, I did make the comment to Andrea, it takes a long time to make progress on this. This is how long they are. They've been declared long enough. Andrea had some very helpful advice. She said, knit faster. You need to knit faster. So, so I just did that. I'm still telling him to knit faster. Yeah, and I still just do what I'm told. So, yeah. You'll recall from the last episode that Andrea cast a very critical eye over this beautiful expanse of stocking stitch to make sure that the knit rows and the pearl rows were perfectly matched. So no rowing out where the pearl stitches are a bit looser than the knit stitches. This is a theme that goes right back to episode two. When he was learning to knit, I really um, put a lot of pressure on him to do a good gauge. To, to It was a lot of pressure. <laughs> to learn to knit his pearl um, and his knit in the same gauge so yeah. it's very even. Here we see and pearls also, and knits in the same gauge. You're going to get me into a lot of trouble. Yeah, well, there is still a lot of pressure and I do still have a lot of tension around my tension. I did say at the time this is going to lead to some more grey hairs. Yes, well, that's true. I think that's played <laughs> out. Yeah. So I am now on to the front piece uh, with its cable and lace section. We have talked about it or I've talked about it before. It's not all that difficult, the pattern. It's got um, some two-by-two two cables. It's got eyelets with left-leaning and right-leaning decreases and a couple of stocking stitches spread along the way. I've got my stitch markers in and I'm managing to not knit them into the material, but I am going fairly slowly. We mentioned knitters of the world. We've had 65 segments in. Something I noticed watching them is some knitters seem to fall into knitting when they start with real ease. And this has just never been the case for me. <laughs> Back in episode five, episode five, I'm still talking about my first pair of socks. Okay, I found it fairly awkward. I find the whole lot of it fairly awkward, to be honest. <laughs> So I think I am still a fairly awkward knitter, but I do think things are improving gradually. Um, I can remember in earlier projects where I'd get to a stitch like a knit two together and it was just incredibly difficult. It just seemed impossible for me to get the needle into the two stitches. Um, and every, every one of those stitches was a feat of persistence. You're making our audience feel wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, look, this is, this is my, my experience. <laughs> Um, but I do think things are improving gradually. I'm doing the cables in this and I am persisting with doing the cables without a cable needle and it does always feel touch and go as far as getting the needle back into the stitches without splitting the yarn. But actually it seems to work most of the time. You're and a I, marvel. I get it done in a finite amount of time so that's really good. And I have to say I've got the slip one, knit one, pass slip stitch over. I'm whizzing through them. You're would, actually enjoying them. I would almost say I enjoy them, yeah. <laughs> but there are still occasional problems. And this is a bit oh, of a tough, yes. <laughs> this is a bit of a tough story to say, but I was concentrating really hard. I was really focused because we do have the telly on. So I was just making sure I was getting every stitch right and keeping track of where I was in the in the pattern. And I thought I was doing pretty well, and I think I actually was. There was just one problem. I was looking, I just got the feeling that it wasn't matching the row below. Something was a bit <laughs> off. So I had a little look. And the problem that I had was I started my pattern here. <laughs> he started doing his pattern here on top of the stocking stitch. Yeah, um, I think it was when I got here that I thought, mm, this is odd. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a sad one. The other, the other one I had recently, I get these mysteries, like things happen and I don't know how they happened. So I'd done, I'd done a successful pattern row and then I did the pearl row back, which is really easy, and then I'm going back to do my pattern again. And I came across a stitch and somehow I'd wrapped the yarn around the needle twice. I have no idea how I, how I did this, but in situations like this, it's just the same as what I did in episode two. 
Okay, because funny things happen along the way, and um, and I sort of go crying off to Andrea and get her to help me out of it. Well, you don't go crying off to me anymore. You just kind of sit there and mutter and sort of yeah. swear, and I think, oh, just give it to me. <laughs> yeah, the stress level rises visibly, yeah. and then you grab it. So I have peace and quiet. I grab it and fix it for you. <laughs> yeah, so there's one one last thing that I wanted to mention here, and that is this uh, This is I, I'm actually learning from you because you always do modifications. You've just said yeah, I do. <laughs> to make your garments fit. Well, this is a fitted garment. So it's got some, I've just finished this section of decreases and I had to do a decrease at the beginning and end of every eighth row. And that was a pattern row. Yeah. What I found happened was I'd get to the end of that pattern row and I'd think I need to do decreases here. But unfortunately I'm here. So at the end of the row and I've forgotten the decrease at the beginning so my solution to that and this is my modification is I would do the decrease at the end of the pattern row and then I'd pull back and do a decrease at the end of the next row so my decrease is sort of a one yeah. row lopsided yeah so if you ever see Andrea wearing this garment you can have a, a close like look this. and see if she's a bit skew if but um because you're concentrating on getting through the lace section so much you forget yeah, that's about kind doing of the, it the, the primary thing and I think overall the thing is I have trouble bringing everything together and I thought there's kind of three parts to it, right? There's being able to do the stitch itself, which is one thing, and that's still not straightforward for me. And then there's getting all the stitches in the right spot, mm -hmm. also not straightforward for me. <laughs> and then there's all the row base stuff, Yeah. right? At and, the same time, do this. Yeah, yeah, and if one of them is difficult, then you're likely to mess up all the others. So I think that's what's happening to me. We got a comment from a viewer called Frog Stitch, and you can see from her name that she does have an understanding of the realities of knitting. I think that was back in episode three. She made a very, um, very pertinent observation. Yeah. She said, Andrew is a hero for yes. doing two at a time socks. And He's totally it's absolutely hero. correct. <laughs> um, I am a hero. I get help from Andrea. And um, yeah. And what Frog Stitch. very inexperienced at knitting socks, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what Frog. Oh, God, what happened there? You're all right. Oh, God. Okay, you keep talking. I'll pick your stitches up. What uh, Frog Stitch said was, um, you're a hero for doing two at a time socks. And everything after that will be a breeze. And I had to write back, I'm looking forward to the breeze. <laughs> yeah, so I'm still waiting for the breeze, but I am going to push through the front of this little top with its cables and lace. And then I'll be breezing through the rest of the stocking stitch sleeves. It and looks I'm, stunning. I'm sure it's going to be ready by summer. Yeah, you're the tortoise and the tortoise always wins. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now you have to disappear because our daughter's coming. Yep. So Madeline's joining us. She's going to go soon, unfortunately, because she has to go back to Ulm. But it's been great to have her for the last three three weeks, four weeks? Four weeks, yeah. Now, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So give us an update. You've started the Fair Isle section. Yep. So I showed you this last week, and last week I'd only done um, all the uh, plain stocking stitch parts yeah. of my jumper. This and is now the Bresser. We'll yeah, just... this is the Bresser by Marie Wallen. Um, and now I've finally started on the ferrule part, which I've been looking forward to for ages, partly yeah. because I just get to work with all these beautiful colors. Yeah, yeah. so mum showed me how to weave in the floats on the right and also on the left hand. And I like the way it just makes your knitting look so neat uh, yeah. on the outside, of course, but also yep, on the inside. Around. On the inside as well, yeah. Yes, so that's great. You're and doing I, a good job. The tension's looking good. Yeah, I had a bit of trouble with that in the beginning. <laughs> um, not too much, but I was holding the tension on my left hand a bit too loosely compared to the yarn on my right hand. So you told me just to wrap the yarn around my finger twice instead of once, and that pretty much solved the problem. Yeah, I do that too. Yeah. Because the left hand is always going to be slightly looser anyway, but you don't want it to be super loose. So just giving it an extra bit of attention means that both both strands are more even. Yeah. Yeah, so that helped. Um, and as you can see, I'm nearly up to the arms now, but before I can join the sleeves to the, uh, to the body um, to knit the yoke, I need to do this same pattern here. So charts A and B, this is chart B up here, on the sleeves as well. And I'm going to do that um, using magic loop. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually up to that now. It's looking beautiful. Thank you. So it's a different pattern, isn't it, from this one? This is the, the hat that you learnt the two-handed hand, ferrule technique on. Yeah, that's right. So this is the Glacier hat by Toft and was my first ferrule project. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny to compare the patterns because they're so completely different. Um, this one's just one geometric shape that repeats itself across the whole hat and also it's only made up of 
two very strongly contrasting colors. Yeah. So it just really pops out at you. And I find compared to that, the shapes are just a lot more subtle on the Bressa. Um, so they don't stand out as strongly, especially if you've only done a few rows. Um, I think chart B is a good example for that because Marie, she blends her colors a lot more. And you can see here the background color and the motif color, they're pretty similar, especially if you compare yeah. it to the Glacier hat. Yeah. yeah. And I found I wasn't quite able to appreciate the, the pattern that was going to emerge because um, I'd only done a few rows, so I had yeah. to wait quite a few rows until I could see the fuller picture. Yeah, it comes out, the more you've done and you hold it a little bit further away, then you can see the beauty of it more, can't yeah. you? Yeah, it's a bit like um, like an impressionist painting. You can't really see the shapes that they're not, well, the borders of the shapes, they're not as clear cut. Yeah, so you need to stand some. back a bit. Yeah. But it's going to be so stunning, and the colours are really beautiful, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. It's it's pretty much half of the fun in knitting this jumper. But you do most of this. Actually, you always knit in front of the television too, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> so, I, I yeah, I don't find the technique itself too difficult, but I do mess up because I watch in front of the telly. I like to watch Japanese anime. <laughs> and then I'm not always paying attention to the pattern. Um, so, But what does help me is that I try to repeat the pattern sequence to myself. So say it goes... Four two one one two three four two one one two three, and that kind of turns into a rhythm, and I find that easier to memorize that yeah, way. Yeah, so it's just four four stitches of one color, and then two of the other, then three of the other, and then one. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm just working with two colors per row, so I know I just have to alternate. I don't need to remember yeah. which color belonged to what set of stitches. I do that too, and also if you just look down and you notice that maybe you need a green stitch always in the middle of five yeah. stitches in the row below. That helps you keep on track with the pattern. And that's actually generally when I notice that I've done a mistake. <laughs> and it's pretty late because I'm noticing that the row that I'm doing right now, some stitch doesn't line up with yeah. the one underneath. And then you have to unpick the whole row. But you're doing a really good job. You're not doing it very fast because I suppose you're studying a lot. But keep going. Yeah. And um, I've just got to get her onto the magic loop on the sleeve before you leave. And then yes. hopefully you'll do it when you're in Ulm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for popping in and saying hi. No worries. Two weeks ago, this most amazing gift arrived for us in the post. Florian, who is one of our patrons in Berlin, recreated, recreated a replica of our lounge room which is of course the fruity knitting set in knitting yeah it's so, so amazing i was completely <laughs> speechless when i was un i had no idea what it was going to be and i'm unpacking it and i was completely speechless for, speechless for quite a while just looking at all the incredible detail yeah that is incorporated yeah it's amazing to go through and discover all the things that are included here you can see the major features so the couch is the right color it's there and the, and the walls the and, walls and, and the, the wallpaper and the table and the chairs are there but he's also got uh, the, the pictures on the walls here. We've got two pictures. He's got them in and they're the right mm -hmm. colours. Yeah. Um, he's included the little tray table that we have on the side. He's put it here and it's even got lace around it, just like the decoration on the, on the side of yeah, that. Yeah, so it looks perfect. There's a project for each of us on the couch and very appropriately, I've got a pair of socks. Yeah. <laughs> and Andrea has a fair old sweater, which and is looking very Alice Darmore. It is. It's an Alice Darmore designed ferrile sweater it's an extraordinary yeah. it's really amazing yeah it's it's even got lights up here and a light in the corner just like we have i love the light in the corner yeah yeah that's three, very observant three chairs and the table and the and the fruit yeah and the and the um cupboard behind it's just amazing yeah so we've asked florian to come on and be our guest on knitters of the world and he's going to tell us all about how he made it Florian from Berlin in Germany. One of my hobbies is knitting, another one is purling. For the 100th episode of my favorite podcast, Fruity Knitting, I wanted to do a little gift for Andrea and Andrew, just to say thank you for your amazing and inspiring work during the last years. A pair of socks for Andrea and a jumper for Andrew 
didn't seem to be the appropriate gift, so I decided to make them their Offenbach studio. At first, I did a little sketch about um, how to position the walls, in which angle, everything like that, and I was limited by the German standard parcels, because in the end I have to send everything from Berlin to Offenbach and it should arrive safe and sound there. After that I used um, grey cardboard and cut out all the walls, um, including windows and uh, cupboard, and um, I used it double for more stability. I really had to swatch all my needles, all my yarns, a swatch for every size because I really needed to have a correct gauge in centimeters for my stitch count and also for the row count. So everything had to fit perfectly on those cardboard. After that I started rewatching all the episodes of Fruity Knitting again and again and again to get an information about all the little details. So let's do a little tour through the Offenbach studio. At first there is the kitchen. It was quite easy to knit and easy to embroider. There is um, a little bowl of fruit hidden in the kitchen with a pineapple on it. I never saw a pineapple on the big table, only an abundance of apples, tangerines, bananas, kiwis. So the poor pineapple has to have a space in fruity knitting, in my opinion. After that, I did the wall with um, the door to the kitchen. First, I did it in blue with a white embroidery because I thought it is blue wallpaper with white flowers on it. Then I discovered, no, it is a white wallpaper with blue leaves on it. So I had to redo this whole part again. Now let's go to the garden. I did a little sketch with um, the clouds, the trees, shrubbery, everything, and knitted it. Then I embroidered some roses because in the real garden there are roses. Also in the knitted garden there shall be roses again. In the finished project nobody will see them, but I know they are there and that's the most important thing, I think. The wall with the window was easy again. The window itself was the hardest part to sew because I really had to, to wrap um, the knitted fabric around the cardboard and um, sew it in very limited space. So ah, I cursed so hard doing it that I really had to go to a full confession afterwards. The cupboard on the back wall was knitted and sewn according to the window. The back side took me a while to do all the little details and also thinking about what color has glass because I needed to embroider all the glassware. So is it a sparkling silver? Is it a light gray? Is it white? Hmm. And uh, seeing during the episodes someone uh, rearranging all the books and all the crockery didn't help me either. But I think it came out quite good. Um, then I did the chairs and the table and also the bowls of fruit. It was quite a relaxing part. And um, the little flowers, uh, there are roses. Um, I took the pattern here of Flora the flower arranger, a teddy bear designed by Alan Dart, a British knitted toy designer. And as you can see, the, she has roses in her basket, also some roses on her hat. Um, the sofa in front of the table was relaxing to do and to keep its angular shape I filled it with little sponges. On the sofa there is on the Andrew side a little sock in socket stitch and on the Andrea side a little jumper in an um, Henry VIII inspired pattern I just looked it up at Alice Darmore's beautiful patterns. All those details and um, the pictures 
in on the walls were knitted with 1.5 millimeter DPNs in a yarn used normally for strengthening a sock's heel. So it comes with a ball of sock yarn and there is a little spool with a very thin yarn just for strengthening but it was very good with those tiny needles to do those tiny detail stuff and it is quite strong. The whole project took me about seven weeks to knit, to sew and to glue everything after planning and sketching was done. So that's it. Thank you for forcing me to do this in Fruity Knitting and I hope to enjoy at least 100 more of your lovely episodes. Bye! So that was really the most touching and special gift. Very original. Yeah, so original and just so thoughtful. I'm still like speechless, you know, that he's, he's put in so much effort and trouble. It's a very, very special thing. And I really love, like he said, the hidden details. So through this window here is where the garden is and it's got the climbing roses and that's exactly where our roses are in our garden. And then through here, the kitchen, our purple kitchen with the oven and the pineapple in the in the bowl and Florian we do have a pineapple on the table in your honor now yeah <laughs> so I hope you enjoy that so it's really special all, all of the little details they're just lovely so you may, he didn't tell you this but Be, um, Florian is from Berlin and he also really enjoys painting so if you go back and have a look you'll see a painting behind him where he's talking and that's one of his and he also enjoys playing the clarinet so the beautiful music that you've just heard is Florian's request and that's Schubert's Der Hirte auf dem Felsen which translates as the shepherd on the rocks and uh, that's a stunning trio for piano, soprano and clarinet and he's played it so he wanted to have it on the show. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed it Florian. Yeah, the one other feature there which I'll mention is the, the beautiful building, the palace that he's knitting in front of, that's the Charlottenburg Palace yeah. in Berlin. So, yeah, so yeah. thank you so much Florian both for that wonderful gift but also for coming on the show at such yeah. short notice <laughs> and doing a great job of telling us how you did it. So we're going to have a quick question and answer session. These are some questions which have come from our viewers. The first few have come from our viewers and actually some of these questions have come up a few times over the years. And then I've thrown in a couple of questions from myself. So, and they're to me, are they? Yes, all questions for you. So first question is, when did the first episode come out and did we already have a plan for where we wanted it to go? Okay, well... Many of you will know the first episode came out in March in 2016. So prior to that, my occupation was performing and teaching. So I was performing singing and I was teaching singing and piano. But in 2015, I had a fairly mild but really, really frustrating illness which stopped me from singing. So I couldn't do any performing and teaching was also a challenge. So that was really emotionally disturbing and hard for me during that time. So I really delved into my knitting and I'm kind of a, a bit of an all or nothing intensive person. So <laughs> I did it a lot. And I also started really searching around for documentaries or interviews on knitting. So documentaries on knitting traditions or knitting techniques or interviews with really top people in the knitting world. 
and I couldn't find anything. So I could find, say, a 10 minute interview with Kay Facet or 10 minutes on Shetland knitting or something. But you know, as a knitter, you like to sit down for at least a half an hour. Settle in for yeah, a set, session. Settle in. You don't want to be watching something for five minutes and then spend another 15 minutes searching around for something. So I thought, if I'm really looking for this, there must be a ton of other knitters who would also really like this. So that's sort of how the idea started for me. Okay. But I had no idea how I could possibly make that work or what format I would do it in because I wasn't listening to any or watching any podcasts and I didn't know knitting podcasts existed. So mm. it just kind of percolated in my brain for a while and I just mulled over it probably for a, a good six months. And during that time, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that to do it really well, I couldn't do it as a, as a hobby. It would have to be full-time work to do it properly and to do it enough so that you could keep getting an audience and build an audience for it so again I thought you know I'm not independent we're not independently wealthy and I have to work so how would I make it pay for itself so I had no idea how it, the concept could actually work until we came across Patreon yeah and then I started to have this clear clearer idea of what path we could take yeah. That might work. Yeah, so before we actually started, I did have a fairly clear goal as to where I would like yep. to end up, yeah. All righty. <laughs> so big question here, what does the name Fruity Knitting mean? We have had this question so many times over the last four years and we never give the answer. I've never it's... seen an answer. <laughs> it's our little secret. We don't, we don't tell the answer to this. But I will say the word fruity has many, many con connotations that we've only recently found out. Yeah. <laughs> it's been interesting for us to, to hear people's interpretations of our names. But there was one interpretation that I particularly liked, which we came across, I think, about two years ago. Yep. Someone told us that in some parts of the UK, to say somebody is fruity, it means that they're sexy or they're hot. So it's like saying sexy knitting or hot knitting. And I thought that's a pretty cool interpretation of our yeah, name. We'll take that. <laughs> yeah. All righty. What are the least favorite and most favorite parts of producing the show? Well, I'd have to say, if you take all of the least favorite parts out, then everything else is my favorite part because it is a really varied job. Mm-hmm. But okay, so we'll, we'll take the least favourite ones first and get them over and done with. I definitely say the administration because I have to write a lot of emails and I'm slightly dyslexic. <laughs> My spelling's atrocious, but it's really important to write these explanations in a clear and concise manner and to make, and there's a lot of that going back and forth. So I don't enjoy that. That's hard work for me. Yeah. What else? I'd also say, Oh, technical te technical problems and challenges, both of our, our own technical difficulties with our, you know, recording and our guests, because we have to help our guests do things that they're often not used to doing. So that's really challenging. Yeah. That can be really hard. And another thing is sort of last minute, unexpected, nerve wracking occasions, <laughs> because you can sometimes just spend, like I spend a lot of time preparing an interview and then I spend a lot of time with the guests together preparing it then they spend a lot of time preparing their stuff and then we come together to record it and just one little thing can go wrong and all of those hours are just gone or and you, and you put if, if you're traveling and you're meeting them and doing a live interview then you, you might have travel expenses expenses and accommodation expenses on top of that so that you can get these really moments of hair raising frustration yeah <laughs> so and then I suppose another one more frustrating part, <laughs> this feels like confession here, would be when we have complaints. Yeah. Because you're always going to get complaints and sometimes they can feel incredibly exasperating and incredibly unfair and I'm quite volatile. And so it's really good to have two of us here so that if we, we get a complaint and you know, I can't deal with it. So sometimes, and it works both ways. It's great for the other person to say, oh, look, that doesn't affect me. I'll respond. Because you have to try to stay friendly and constructive. And sometimes that real urge is just to, to let rip when yeah. it's not appropriate. So that's a challenge. But I have to say, out of all of the least favorite parts, the overriding thing is that it's a job that it gives you plenty of opportunity for personal growth. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Which is a privilege, actually. It's good to be able sure. to have a job that is pushing you in all areas that you have to get better at in all areas. 
Yeah. That can feel like a nightmare sometimes, but it's also a privilege to have a job that's challenging you. Yep. So on to the favourite parts. Favourite parts, yes. Let me have another drink. <laughs> Without a doubt, overwhelmingly, it is such a privilege to get to meet so many great experts who are so passionate about what they do. And not only is it great to be able to work with them, but also... So many, many of them have had to work really hard themselves or overcome certain obstacles to get to where they are. So it means that they're very interesting characters as well. And that's a real privilege to get to meet people like that and work with them. So I love that. I yep. really love that. I love to give them a platform and, and show, share their story. So the humanistic part is, is really important. Also, they're trusting me, you know, they, they're giving me their content and they're trusting me to present it. And I take that really seriously. So I take my job of helping them prepare their content in a way that's going to present themselves in the best possible way very seriously. And that's, that's a lot of fun, but it's also very challenging. And every guest is different. Every guest has got different strengths and they've all got different personalities. So again, that's that humanistic side of working with people is a big privilege and I really love that part. Yep. Another really sort of fantastic part is when you get those huge moments of relief because you think something is just not working out, you're really worried about something, it's, it doesn't look like it's coming together, you might have spent a lot of time on it, but then it actually turns out way better than you thought and that is such a pleasurable feeling, isn't it? Yeah. It's just that huge moment of, oh, that's so good. I had no idea it was going to end like this. Thank God. You know, that, that's a fantastic moment. And that, that sort of, I suppose we live and breathe fruity knitting, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I want to give a really quick example of that. Our Knitters of the World segment started way back in episode four. And it was Andrew's idea. So he came up with the idea of Knitters of the World. And I really don't like the... T I do all the editing, but I hate the technical side of stuff. So he f figures out how to do all the tools and then he teaches me to do the tools and then I do all the creative part, which I really enjoy. And when he first of all presented the idea of Knitters of the World, I thought, no way, too much work. It's not sustainable. We can't do it on a long-term basis. It would just be way too much work and for such a short amount, I can't do it. So I gave him a no, but it wasn't a real hard no. It was sort of a softish no. <laughs> But then I started corresponding with a knitter who was living in the Arctic Circle in Norway. And to me, that's extraordinarily exotic as an Australian. It's like the other end of the world. And how on earth anyone can survive a winter is just amazing. And she was a really good knitter. So spontaneously, I said to Andrew, OK, let's try it out on her. And that was Lena Alva. She was our very first knitter of the world. So... I asked her and uh, we sort of wrote down a format. So we want you to film this, 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 and this, and say this, 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 and this, and sent it off to her. And what she sent back, and she did it inside one week, was so good. It was way better than what I'd even imagined Knitters of the World could be. So she kind of set the bar for Knitters of the World. And that was such a good moment because yeah. I thought, wow, she's shown me something that I didn't realize could be. Yeah. So I'm forever grateful to Lena Alva. <laughs> <laughs> for being our very first knitter, knitter of the world and for setting the standard so high. So yep. that was a really exciting part of the job. Yep. Surprises. Anything else? There's probably lots of things, but... Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. That's what... I mean, working with other people, it's... Mm. it's I mean, you, you sort of mentioned meeting big people, but it's also meeting people who are more Unknown, but early great. in their career. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, everyone, everyone's just battling. Yeah. I know. don't mean big names. I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who are excellent and they're not well known. Yep. So I don't care about being well known. I care about what they know, how, yeah. you know. Yeah. And people push themselves to, yeah. to do their best. So that's really yeah. cool. All righty. Right. Question from me. If I couldn't be here, who would you have, who would you like to have as co-host? <laughs> Or maybe just plain, who would you actually like to have as co-host? I'm happy to have you. I don't think anyone else would put up with me. That's <laughs> another question, yeah. That's another <laughs> Okay, but if I could choose another co-host, I reckon I'd have Anna from Anna and Carlos. I love his hair and I love his glasses and he's just so cool. I love the way he does his tutorials because he sits there and he's, hands are flying around and his DPNs, he's got about 15 of them all yeah. flying around in different um, directions and he's doing his Norwegian style knitting and he sits there doing his tutorials and he says things like, 
So this is very easy. You just do this and then this and then a little bit of this and now I'll show you how I finish. It's just like this. See nothing to it. It's very easy. And you can see that Carlos is sitting next to him and he does most of the talking because he's more confident in English. Comfortable, yeah. And he's getting a little bit cross with Anna. So he says things like, now Anna, remember that we were going to go slowly so that people can see clearly what you're doing and they don't get confused. And Anna's there going, yes, yes, I'm slowing right down. <laughs> it's hilarious. And it's moving at the speed of light. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. I love it. Right. But who would you take? Oh, well, just on Anna. I don't think I can catch up on the DPNs, but a couple more weeks of lockdown and I'll have the hair. You'll definitely have the hair. Yeah, maybe a bit more <laughs> grey than Anna's, but yeah. Me, um, I would say Constance Cadell is the best candidate. Yeah, she is, she is cool. an extremely accomplished knitter. If you've seen any of her work, I think she's on her fourth uh, Alice Starmore design. She's at least, also yeah. at, at the same time working on a Marie Wallen, so very yeah. accomplished. Also sews and crochets and I yeah. think she does embroidery and all of that. But apart from all of that, I think she's a really inspirational figure. She is. And I think she would in inspire people. I think she does inspire people in all sorts of ways. So that She's would be a great. darling. Yeah. And she's gorgeous on top of it. Yeah, well, I can't say that. But, but I can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, so that's our co-hosts. What else Last question. In what area do you feel like we have really improved over the years? <laughs> Are there okay. any? Yes, there definitely are. So as I said, I do all the editing, but I hate figuring out how to do the editing, as in how to use the, the equipment. So the Andrew learns out how to do the tools and then tells me, and then I just do what I want to do. And I really loved it when he showed me how to do colour correction because mm. I love colour. Uh, excuse me. And I think at the beginning I was just – so overblown on colour saturation. I really saturated everything because I just love intense colour. So I don't think I'm so heavy-handed with the saturation. Right. And also I think our lighting at the beginning, we didn't light the back of our room. And it just looks like we're sitting in a cave recording. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's kind of gloomy. We went through a couple of phases with lighting. Yeah. But, yeah, getting the lights at the back, that was a big step up. Yeah. If you watch any, any video on how to do good video, they all say, do your lighting. It's yeah. all about lighting. Anyway, yeah. so we've learned that. On my side, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I agreed to do this when you asked, when we started, Andrea said, I would like you to be in on this with me. And one of the reasons I agreed to that was I was sort of up for a challenge, speaking in front of a camera, but actually just speaking at all because <laughs> I wouldn't say I was a natural orator. <laughs> So, yeah, that's that's been the big thing for me. And I would like to think we've improved. I've actually put together a little compilation from episode five and I hope that we have improved since then. You're going to find this particularly interesting. Um, 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 and, um, 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 yeah, um, um, yeah, um, and stick around for the next bit because it's really good. Um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I, um, 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 uh, um, 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 Shall um, I continue or not? Well, yeah. Um, 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 uh, um, 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 we should we say are, goodbye now. We're going to say goodbye, <laughs> yes. We will say very quickly, um, 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 and thank you very much again for allowing us into your living room or wherever you're watching us, and we appreciate that. Apparently people say um or ah when they intend to keep speaking, but they need a moment to think about what they want to say next. So it actually can be a useful signal in conversation, but often it's just a bad habit and it's a really, <laughs> it's a really hard habit to break. When I had the idea of putting that compilation together just for a bit of fun, I thought I'd have to go through a few episodes to get enough material, but I just picked episode five at random. And it turned out there was more than enough material in that to do us. <laughs> That's quite embarrassing. It was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. I hope you found it fun too. Yeah. 
So we would really like to thank all of our wonderful patrons for supporting the show. The work that goes into making the show has meant a complete change of lifestyle for both of us, where everything we're doing is basically geared around producing content for the show. And that's only possible with the financial support of patrons. So thank you so much to all of our wonderful patrons who have made that possible for us. Thank you. So coming up right now is the compilation of highlights. I think you'll really enjoy it. I loved watching it through. I've watched it twice after it's all finished and I really enjoyed it. There's a couple of, they're not my favorite ones. I, I love all of them, but they're a good mixture. Like I said, there's a couple that I want to point out though. One of the highlights is from a very early interview that we did with Anne and Eugene Bourgeois who were really big names in the knitting world in the 80s and 90s in America and Canada. And they're wonderful people. And I learnt the two-handed ferrule technique from watching Anne's videos. So I'm forever grateful to Anne for that. And the other highlight I want to point out is an early interview that we did with the UK designer Jimenez Joseph, who I really enjoyed. And Jimenez has wonderful designs, very stylish and modern. And during the compilation that's coming up, you'll hear her talk about how she developed her own color coded system of writing patterns. So Jim, Jimmy Knits, which is her design name, is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off all her self-published patterns. And last episode, we featured the double knitting expert, Alastair Post Queen, and many of you were completely blown away by his extraordinary designs. So Alastair is also offering Fruity Knitting patrons a discount of his individual patterns and his books. And the details for all the discounts are on the Patreon page. So cheers, here's the 100th episode of Fruity Knitting. Thanks for being with us. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> We really appreciate your company. Coming up now is the highlights, which I think you'll really enjoy. Episode 101 is going to be one week later. And that's because during this lockdown period, we've had a few setbacks. Yeah. <laughs> Episode uh, interviews that were meant to happen didn't happen. Technical issues came up. And so we're a little bit behind. We need to work hard. To, and we've got a few really good interviews coming up that we really need to cram and prepare on. So... Episode 101 will be one week later, but we'll make it a good one for you. Okay. Bye. Bye. If only a king could be king without state. If only a rich man could give at his gate. If only a poor man could laugh at his fate. What a wonderful world it would be. What a wonderful world it would be. And, um, then I didn't knit at all until we went to Scotland and I was teach on a teaching exchange and all the teachers knit at recess and the bell didn't go until they'd knitted and unwound themselves enough from a rather difficult classroom situation. And um, so at the end of the week they had some knitting to show for recesses and I had nothing. Well that just didn't seem very efficient to me. So I said, if I get some wool, will you guys help me? It was the time of the Icelandic sweaters. The, 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 anyhow, so I learned um, how to do the um, weaving behind so that there were no yeah. strands. Um, and that's really where I learned how to do it. I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> Except that the weaving with the left hand, I hadn't learned how to do because the patterns I was following didn't need it. And when I did meet it, I also met a very sweet lady who said, that's very nice, dear. I can see you weave with the right hand, but can you weave with the left hand? And I said, not yet. And she said, just a minute, and I'll show you. I haven't done it for 50 years. It'll take me a while to remember. She was back in two minutes. She said, no, the fingers remember, and showed me how to do it. So that's how I learned how to do it, and I've been doing it ever since. Well, I was doing a, a degree in mathematics and computer science and um, and then switched from that to logics and then philosophy, all the while trying to find a way to make myself unemployable. I just didn't want to get a job because I'm anti-war. It was the period of Vietnam. And I thought that's just that's just a true obscenity where, where a nation takes its, its bright and best young people and sends them to a battlefield. And, and so I decided then that I would not want to have any earned income because I didn't want to pay taxes.
which was that made that makes a little bit of difficulty. But I decided, unrealistically, um, at, or from everybody's point of view except mine, that I would build a farm. I when they asked me, well, you've never picked up a hammer. How do you expect to build a farm? And I said, well, you know, from the Pythagorean theorem, what more do you need to know to build a farm? But once I had sheep, much to my horror, I discovered I had a business. And I suffered at that time from the prejudice that business is bad and, and, um, and that profits were bad. And, and it didn't take me long before I realized that not only is it possible to lose money farming, but that profits themselves aren't necessarily bad. And no, so no. What, it puts what, food on the table. <laughs> it sure does. And what a what a, a transformation for me from, from this idealism to, to a sort of practical reality. And so what I would do is I would study the drawings and maybe use some of the schematics or the information I was given there and then so, and reprogram everything. So I would redraw it and, and some and then sort of copy what I saw on the, on the, from the magazine and knit by eye. You've been trained and have worked as a graphic designer and I can imagine that would definitely influence your designs for knitwear and yeah. working with colour, etc. But did it also um, influence how you wrote your patterns? Yes, very much so. I, I think it's because we, um, as graphic designers, we are trained to... Um, try convey information that is given to us in the most comprehensive manner that can be understood by the general public. So we, you have to look at logic, you have to look at um, flow, how somebody would read something from left to right, from up to down, and so from up and down, and so on. And, um, you know, we'll use diagrams, we'll use colour, we'll use emphasis, you know, in, in wording and, you know, and, um, and format. So that all is how it's um, how it transfers or translates into my patterns in a lot of ways. So your patterns would probably look pretty different to a normal pattern that you would see in a magazine, a published magazine. Is that right? Pretty much. Um, I tend to work more long-handed rather than short. You know, using um, uh, abbreviations for everything. Um, you know, where something might be confusing, you know, that couldn't be described in words, I would probably use a diagram. I, I have illustration skills, so I can, I can draw what I need to um, communicate. And what's the feedback you've got from people who have knitted your patterns? How, how have they liked oh, working? They, they love it. Um, my, I, I, it's, it's been amazing because um, uh, many knitters who have knitted from my patterns, the first thing they'll say is, I love how you colour code everything. And I colour code all the sizes and all the numbers referring to those sizes. So it's easy for the knitter to be able to quickly get to that information, you know, pertaining to their size and work around those, you know, those without having to keep, you know, highlighting everything um, as you would normally do with most knitting patterns. So. up seeing your mum actually working on her own small business you know as a kid you would have seen her constantly develop her own small business so have you seen you've had first-hand experience of that and then you've gone to business classes is there anything that you've picked up from your mum that you weren't taught in your business classes being around my mom I just realized that it's it's good to sometimes take a chance on yourself and, and take a risk um, because I, I remember we were in New York and we met with a couple of, our, couple of people from the publishing company and they, they were telling me how small of a chance it was that her book even came to light. And um, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of times people are maybe put these artificial limitations on themselves and sometimes it's good to just put yourself out there and, and I don't know, a lot, it seems like a lot of time, times good, good things come back. So. <laughs> so it seems like you work very well together. Yeah, we're good friends. We are. <laughs> we're good friends. I had thought, you going to business school, did you start seeing your mother as an underdeveloped asset? 
<laughs> was that one of your motivations? Because she does, she certainly, she has so much there going for her that she does kind of need a business head behind her, you know, and is that how you viewed your mother? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but I just see her. She always, um, she's very nice and she's, she does things for other people all the time. And that maybe it's time for her to have her own own thing to hang her head on. And yeah, yeah exactly. So, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've worked. You know, I've promoted other companies. I've worked for other companies. You know, just for years and years, and just to have something of my own and and to be able to share. You know, the way I I want to share it. And um, I I really couldn't do all of that on my own. It's it's just it's so much work, and it's can be, you know, overwhelming at times. And um, to have someone helping me take care of um, the business aspect. And I have to say too, my husband does a lot too. So as far as the business side, he's an attorney and he's been a really helpful force along the way too. So he, he helps us a lot too. Um, and, and has been extremely supportive um, of the business too, so. Whenever we have these kinds of forces that are applied to our body, we're susceptible to injury. We tend not to think about that because, you know, unlike weightlifting or, you know, running a marathon, knitting doesn't wear us out to max, the point of maximal fatigue. But it's the submaximal fatigue that gets us into trouble, just like computer use. So I want knitters to understand um, where this risk lives in knitting. Um, I want them to be able to read the book and identify parts of their knitting techniques that are p potentially risky and say, oh, that's me. And then I want them to follow up with the suggestions that I've made for what can you do to reduce the risk. And, and you know, some of it might be very simple, what I call low-hanging fruit, like stand up every once in a while or make sure you're drinking or higher-hanging fruit, like you know, this tensioning technique isn't really serving me and it's causing some discomfort in my shoulder or elbow. What are the typical problem areas where the majority of injuries take place, just so that a knitter can start to become aware as a preventative? So I think that a lot of the knitting injuries that I've seen are driven from posture, where we actually are, are doing our work, and then the way that we're tensioning our yarn. And then the third thing that really jumps into this is how you've matched the yarn to the needle. So for example, with a continental knitter, um, there's oftentimes discomfort in this part of the elbow, and it's from a faulty kind of tensioning technique. Oftentimes with English style knitters, there's discomfort in this part of the wrist, again, from um, a faulty tensioning technique. Um, I've seen shoulder problems from people who like to sit in, in chairs or sofas and rest on the armrest um, while they're knitting, and that can, can cause shoulder injuries. So they can come from a lot of different areas. And um, just reading through your book, uh, you talk about overuse and underuse injuries. So what's the underuse? Well, underuse injuries um, are very insidious. Underuse injuries are when we don't put enough force on the tissue. And these kinds of injuries, and I, I like to call all the injuries, um, overuse and underuse, um, that are related to ergonomics, cumulative trauma disorder, because it really is reflective of um, either too much or too little force being put on the tissue consistently. Um, so the, the term RSI or repetitive strain injury, I tend not to use that just because repetition is something that's important in knitting. It's how we make our fabric. And if you're afraid of it, you probably won't want to be a knitter for very long. Yeah. Um, so um, the underuse injuries would be things like deconditioning, loss of muscle strength, loss of cardiovascular capacity, loss of range of motion. I've had knitters in class who've had um, blood clots in their legs because they've been so sedentary during um, during uh, bouts of knitting. And, and that's quite dangerous. You know, the, some of them have landed in the hospital. So the underuse injuries are, are ways that our, our body starts to break down as opposed uh, from not having enough stress as opposed to the overuse injuries where our body starts to break down from having too much stress applied to it. I love 
love to be one of the first in it from a new design. <laughs> it's just because I love to be one of the first. Of course, I learn a lot about technique and how a pattern is written because this is one of the things that I didn't know before. I always, I, I was a best, bad, bad, bad tester. I always changed these patterns to my own liking and <laughs> to fit my body and my style better. Then I have testers that do very, very good photographs. So, and I need good photographs yeah. too, to show how the design looks on other people's. Yeah. Of course, I model my designs yeah, myself, yeah. but not everyone knows that. And some of them think, oh, it's professional photography and they put in some things yeah. in the back and they make a good yeah. light and such things. So it's good to have another photography a real photograph yeah. and also I try to have testers in a big size range to show the design on an extra small and to show the design on an extra large. Also I try to have one or two or even a few more new testers with every test because my core testers group is getting used to my way of writing yeah. and they so tend to overread look, yeah. things and they they know what I want when I read uh, when I write some things and um, the new ones are the ones that say what do you mean with that what should I do here and could you be clearer here so it's good to have two or three new ones in every test yeah to get a fresh eye on these things Great. I think they are cool all of them are cool, and I'm so proud of them. <laughs> <laughs> they are doing such a good job. <laughs> the most important thing I learned with dressmaking is about proportions of a body and about grading the sizes for patterns. N not particularly the pattern writing. That is just one part that I had to learn very hard. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of books that told me how to write a knitting pattern. I think the most valuable part of this education was that I know where to put shaping into the patterns, how long an armhole has to be, how long a yoke has to be, how wide a shoulder has to be, and where to put in shaping into a garment to make it fit very well or not that well. So. <laughs> I think that is the most important part I got from this. Yeah, I think I, I, I like to add short rows into my patterns. And I think this is the transition of knitwear and, and uh, dressmaking between the darts and what we do with short rows in knitwear. At how to add them, where to add them to make up for a larger bust size mm -hmm. or for a longer torso yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You usually want to provide a canvas so that the colorful, so either the, the color stitch pattern or the textured stitch pattern can really be on display. If the background is super busy, then the stitch detail will get lost. So um, yeah, I, I do that very, very often that I use a neutral yarn for the background and then colors. Mm. Yeah, and um, it breaks it up more, doesn't it? It just, right. It actually makes it blend yes. more than having hard, yes. hard yes. lines. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Great. Okay. Um, I'm getting a nice little pile here. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is another one, and I would like to show the wrong side first mm -hmm. because this is an example of slip stitch color work. So looking at the wrong side, um, you can see, okay, there is probably some stripes going on. But slip stitch color work um, produces vertical strands on the right side of your knitting and horizontal strands on the wrong side. So the effect of this is that when you only look at the wrong side, you have no idea about all the vertical uh, accents going on on the front. So let's take a look at the front of the show. This shawl. is a stunning one. I got, a, I got <laughs> an <it>? early peak. <laughs> Isn't it? That's really stunning. Um, all these vertical strands here are created by the slip stitches and um, again what I like in, um, in just this hold technique, it straight so they can see it what I like in this technique is that it's again it is easy to make so you don't have to like work your brain a lot to get a beautiful result 
Um, and also focusing again on one single stitch pattern, it gives the shawl a very well balanced look. It's mm. not like it's too overloaded mm. or too crowded. Yeah, it's, I can see a theme here. I like the fact that you have these blank neutral sections and then you have a really beautiful mm. looking pattern yes. in a certain section of it. Yes, it's again having a neutral color and a, and something that is more... Yeah, a neutral texture too. Yes. And then yes. showing off something that's busier. Yeah. Right. And during the 20th century, they developed this type of fleece from this, um, which is very consistent and uniform from the head to the tail, whereas the old type of fleece was not. It had v significant changes within the wool type from um, one part of the fleece to another. So this type of animal likes to live on the lowland. Uh, at Uradale we have uh, the green fields which are generally along the coast and uh, where the previous generations have uh, cultivated the land. Whereas this type of sheep uh, with the double coat lives mostly up on the hilltops which are uh, by and large peatland uh, covered in heather and mountain grasses. That can be spun is worsted, which is spinning in the fibres line in that direction, and you spin in that direction. Or you can do woolen, where the fibres lie in that direction, and you spin in that direction. Okay. It gives you your light, fluffy yarn. Yeah. So this one, just with your fingers, there's no air trapped in this. And ply it over on itself gives you a, an intact. Yeah, this one, if I fudge this, because it should be rolled and then spun, you should be able to see immediately that's a fluffier yarn. Okay, I see what you're doing. Okay, so this is the worsted and this is going to be the woolen. Yeah. Okay, two different yarns. Yeah. It's a short draw, and this I'll get finer and finer until I'm down to a few fibres. Wow. And when you almost can't see it, you've got it. Squeak. Let's try it. It's really cobweb, isn't it? Wow. Do you think there's about five or six hairs there? 
That's what you want. Down to about five hairs. I was the youngest in a family, and so I spent a lot of time with my mother. And I really learned in it by just being around her. Knitting was a very social thing. Everyone around you was knitting. Yeah. And ladies would greet other, each other by saying, what are you knitting? <laughs> <laughs> I have such a clear memory of um, visiting friends. Um, I would have been about eight at the time. We walked for about half an hour in the moonlight and when we arrived they were all ready for us. Other people were there and um, it was so comforting because the sound of the knitting needles yeah. and uh, women were talking. And we had no electricity at the time so Knitting was done by the Tilly lamp, okay. which worked on paraffin, and it really did give a good light, and then we had the peat fire. With the long, dark winters, you really needed that, didn't you? You did. You used it a lot in the winter. That's right, and it was a comforting thing in itself. My mother once told me that if you're ever worried about anything, just tack your sock. <laughs> Um, I think that fact has been well proven over the years. Yes, it has, mm -hmm. scientifically as well. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a child, I never really, I never realised knitting was so important. It was all so comforting and happy. Little did I know that the women's knitting provided the groceries and an odd luxury here and there. Yeah. The craft provided the meat and the vegetables so the knitting was so important yeah. for the other things. But there was a neighbour not far away. She, had, I think they had three wheels. Yeah. So we would go down with my mother visiting at night, and that was going out about the night. <laughs> yeah. That was But mum would have taken her knitting with her. They okay. never went out anywhere at night without their knitting. So she'd been sitting knitting. And the lady down there, we would have a go on the spinning wheel. Now this shawl, when it's complete, there is neither a cast-on stitch or a cast-off stitch on it. What we do is we start at the, the lace edge and we knit a few rows in a cotton thread. Then after that we get on to the lace edge and we knit all around, all the lace edge. And this one, I know, took me 28 hours to knit that lace edge. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, we start, we pick up enough for the first quarter. I think in this shawl, it's 370 stitches on a quarter. And knit it up and taken in, shaping it all the way. So that one quarter, and you go on, when you've finished your fourth quarter, then you knit that holy row and then you knit in your centre. So after I finish knitting the centre, then I go on and I graft the centre to the, which would have been the second quarter. Mm -hmm. It's grafted on there. And what I graft in is that holy row. That's the grafting row, that row of holes. And what's amazing is it looks exactly the same as the, the row where you picked up stitches to knit this. It's, you well, can't tell what's grafted <laughs> and what's not grafted. Because when we were young, we did learn to graft because that was another thing our mother did. She used to graft. We called it finishing. Mm -hmm. She would get a bag with so many chompers to finish and that was grafting on the necks, grafting on the cuffs and sewing them up and yeah. the rib at the bottom yeah. sewing it up. And when we were came big enough that she could trust us, then we would start and we would graft on a cuff for her. That was mm -hmm. our start. And that's how we learned to yeah, graft. So we all did and that. it's something I absolutely still love doing. Really? Just grafting. Yeah. And so who's the lucky person who's getting this? Well, I don't know. It's not made for anybody special. If somebody came along and asked, wanted to buy it, they could at a price. But at the moment, they go in a box under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so if she gets cold the winter night, she just pulls out one. 
<laughs> and someday when I'm gone and the daughters, four daughters, and I have ten grandchildren, and they come to clear up and they'll find all the shawls under the bed, so I hope there's one for each of them. <laughs> but I'll never forget your kindness and the cottage by the shore. And at each social gathering, a flowing glass I raise and drink. I call it the prisoner of war jumper, mm -hmm. um, but this was knitted by um, a lady called Doris Hunter, who was the fiance of a gentleman called Ralph Patterson, mm -hmm. and Ralph was an engineer during the Second World War, and he was in Hong Kong. And he was there when the island was invaded in Christmas Day, 1941, and he got taken prisoner. And he spent the next four years in Stanley, prisoner of war camp, which was quite a, yeah. an atrocious place yeah. to find yourself. Um, and it just so happened that when he was taken prisoner, he was taken prisoner with his Fair sweater. Out. yeah, And he wore his original of this throughout his incarceration. It's an extremely moving garment to yeah. to look at um, and certainly to get to touch and to, to read. Um, it's very, very heavily darned. Every, almost every part of it is yeah. darned um, and with very short little lengths of thread. Okay. And in my mind's eye, I just see him following other people in the camp and seeing a loose thread off their clothes yeah. and sort of helping himself yeah. to it so he could repair to, his, his jumper. And he's linked to home. Yeah, and he actually wrote, as written and said, that this was, you know, mm. his kept link. Him going. It kept him going. Yeah. yeah. And it's, moving. it yeah. really is a quite, quite, quite special piece, really. Um, and when I was reading this one, um, we were in the archive and... It was a sunny day, but the blinds were down because these things have to be protected. Um, and I was sitting there and my, I thought, oh, am I getting a cold? I was beginning to wheeze. I was getting a sore throat. Then my nose started to run. Then my eyes started to run and then my skin was itching. I thought, this is really, really odd. And then even though the blind was down, the sun shone through the blind. And as it did so, I could just see hundreds and hundreds of fibres just coming up in the air. And I'd been breathing them in. Okay. And yeah. so little bits of Ralph's jumper are actually had come into had you. Come into me. And I <laughs> in just, more ways than one. Yeah. I just I just burst into tears. Yeah. I was in such a state at the very yeah. the very thought of it, you know. Yeah. So this this one has been, yeah, a, a real a real special experience really. Does the, the way that you think about your own knitting and designing differ from how your mother thought about her knitting and designing? And how much of your mother do you see in yourself? Uh, well, her knitting, she I think it was because of her art training. She was in, uh, she studied for years at the Academy in Munich. And you have to take a pre-school in order to get into the Academy. It was a very advanced level of um painting and drawing. And it was a lot of life studies. So a lot of models, drawing models. And I, my own personal theory is that's how she came up with her percentage system of the relationship of parts to the whole was because of her life drawing classes. But she thought of knitting three dimensionally, like a sculptor. And uh, I think of knitting, of course, in that way, because I am her daughter. But also my passion is color pattern. I love to knit geometric patterns, um, if you're knitting a fair isle, oxo, for instance, I find it, it very quickly a song is established when I'm just doing the very first round of the oxo. And I love the little game of the oxos, how the X chases the O to its narrowest part and then expands again, and, uh, and the rhythm of each round. 
So I learn the song of the round, and then I don't even have to look at the graph or the chart anymore. I just sing that song. Uh, it doesn't work very well for socks when you only have about 60 stitches, but it works beautifully for sweaters when you have three or 400 stitches. Everything I do in knitting is influenced by my mother. I even find myself using techniques and doing certain knitting disciplines that she never knew about in her life. But I still feel her influence. It's strange to say that, but I think you know what I mean. Barbed wire fences, watchman towers, and a group of men with felony convictions. I'm in for a second degree assault. Possession. Hardened criminals. This is no white collar country club. I'm arrested for um, um, kidnapping, attempted murder. But listen a little closer. I love knitting. And you realize there's more here than meets the eye. I'm knitting a small hat for a kid. That softer side appears every Thursday around dusk. With two unusual visitors to the pre release unit in Jessup, Maryland. Meet Lynn Zwirling and Sheila Rovelstad. Little did I know that once in the prison, I would have to overcome even the uh, negativity of the guards. Uh, so what I eventually did is, uh, because I was a car saleswoman my whole life, I uh, would not take no for an answer. I needed a, a we call it a hard no. And I didn't think I was getting a hard no from anybody. So I, f I isolated one warden in particular and just annoyed her by calling her and trying to get that hard no from her. She liked the idea, but she couldn't figure out the logistics. So eventually, after five years of trying, she said, all right already. In prison, there's a hierarchy. Whatever your crime was, you act differently than if your crime was, if you're a thief, as an example. You act differently than if you're a murderer. Um, if you were a drug dealer, you act differently than if you were an armed robbery guy. Their crimes really played big, uh, big time in this uh, hierarchy. I tell them that these are the rules. They're very few. First one is, is don't steal from me. Everything that I bring in here has been purchased by me or someone who has happily donated money to us or sometimes maybe even yarn or needles. So don't steal. If you do steal from me, I will find you. I will hunt you down and you will not ever be allowed to be in the class. The second thing that they have to do is, uh, and I make them agree to this rule. Uh, everyone says, oh, no, 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 I, I, I'm not a thief. I guess to be a thief in prison is a pretty bad thing. Um, and what I say to them when they say, I'm not a thief, I say to them, listen, you're going to love this so much that you're going to wish you could take these supplies back to your cell. You're going to love it so much that you're going to want to steal. So I understand that, just don't steal. The second thing I tell them is they have to uh, tell someone, that is someone on the outside, that they are knitting. Uh, this doesn't mean tell your, your uh, cellmate. This means tell your mother, tell your grandma, tell someone that you have disappointed your whole life what you're doing. I say sometimes they'll say, oh, hey, that's terrific, you're doing something great. Sometimes they'll say, what are you, a girly man? Whatever they say, you have to defend the program because I don't have anyone out there defending it. What this affords them is not only the opportunity to have peace and quiet for two hours, but it gives them the opportunity to learn a new skill, create something from scratch, feel pride in what they have, they have created, and pass that hat onto a community that they have probably harmed. Uh, they, they seem to embrace that tremendously. What I don't tell them is, is this will help them with their focus, uh, which is a very big problem. It's very noisy in jail. It's very chaotic in jail. And uh, many, many of the prisoners have some learning disabilities that um, can be overcome with learning how to knit.
I, I'd like to share one little story with you. I had a, a, a guy come in and uh, he said, oh, he said, you won't be able to teach me how to knit. And uh, I said, well, why? He said, well, I have Tourette's syndrome. And then at that second, he exploded with the most awful language you've ever heard. But I said, no, I can teach you. So I worked with him and worked with him, a little more than the five minute lesson, but I did work with him and he did learn how to knit. And he was amazed that he stopped vocalizing. He stopped his tick of, of spewing the worst language you've ever had, heard, excuse me. So he, um, he, he just embraced it. He told me, listen, Miss Lynn, this makes me feel normal. Imagine that. Self-discovery is really an amazing thing. Uh, here I am, 73 years old. I thought I knew myself pretty well. I always considered myself to be a, a liberal. You know, I, I'm always on the right side of uh, social issues. And uh, um, I uh, hate discrimination. And I, uh, I hate immoral people. What I've found that that liberalism that I thought was my, my key uh, trait uh, is nothing compared to the kind of liberal human being I have turned into. I have chosen to spend two hours every week with some people who have committed the most horrendous crimes you could imagine. And I find by looking at them, learning about them, spending time with them, that they are all pretty decent people. I have yet to find very many that do not deserve my time or attention. So I've, I've turned into a true liberal, not just a faux liberal. And um, it, it is really, it amazes me because uh, many of my volunteers that come in, you know, just don't even want to know what crime they committed. They just, it, it's, it's too emotional for them. Um, but since I know what their crime was, and I find myself liking them, in fact, loving some of them. Well, I will show you some of my shawl designs so you can see what I mean. This one here, you can see how I used very pastel background colors. Um, they are blue, but I also added uh, some mustard color to it just to give it a little more color splash. Yeah. Um, and actually this one here, this is something new that I have started on doing that I like to embroider on the on um, on the shawls or on a jacket also the way of knitting with two balls actually has a limitation that the, uh, you can just knit with these two colors so if you want to add an extra color you don't like to to uh, knit with three colors that's too much work so i like to embroider instead so this one here has been embroidered all the stalks have been embroidered i continue with the borderline here this is a very big shawl and then i like to do sort of a fold down edge so when i wear my shawl i can fold down the edge and there is another uh, combination of the color on on the other side that's beautiful so this is um yeah this is quite you know um there are many ways that you can add something interesting to your designs you i could also have chosen to have another pattern in here if i wanted to and uh, even another colorway which i sometimes do with my jackets but i'll show you that later so this was my beach shawl uh we were doing the the programs at a very beautiful little castle in the southern part of denmark and uh, the judges, um, the judge and the other judge and myself, we were introduced to um, to uh, all these uh, lovely knitters, and they were so excited. So off went the first program, and uh, what was really interesting was uh, that we had it was not just like knit a sock. How long does that take? But also knit something to a very dear friend of yours. 
and tell us why uh, your design turns out the way it is. What kind of things do you want to put in this knitting? So um, we had some very, very touching uh, programs where people were knitting uh, things for their best friend, uh, mother who had died or husband and or... Um, uh, yeah, for the children, whatever expressions they, they wanted to, to knit into uh, the projects they did. So it, it turned out to not just be a program about uh, uh, doing Fair Isle and, and yeah, uh, knitting techniques, uh, knitting socks, whatever. Yes, all that. It, it, uh, it turned out to be so much more. And um, uh, what was interesting was that uh, we had uh, so many husbands and men and young children teenagers coming up to us and saying we are watching this program it is so exciting don't vote this one out next time please don't we love her you know so um uh, there was a uh, put some pressure on, uh, on us and of course we did have favorites uh, but we could not show and we had to be fair